Thank you so much for tuning into the show and welcome to Season 2 of The Audiobook Club with John York. The Audiobook Club, partnered with Pro Audio Voices, celebrates audiobooks, the amazing people and teams who make them happen, as well as the various talents behind storytelling. To learn more about Amplify and other opportunities to grow your sales, platform and audience, head over to ProAudioVoices.com and listen out for a short but informational advertisement within this episode. Let's start the show. Hello and welcome to the Audiobook Club. In this week's episode, we're so lucky to be joined once again by audiobook director, producer, narrator, owner of Ladbrook Audio, as well as the founder of Audiobook Creators Alliance, Neil Gardner. Neil, it's such a joy to have you on the show once again. How are you today? I'm really well, thank you, mate. How are you? I'm doing okay. I'm plodding along. <laughs> plodding along. Your life, your jet set lifestyle up and down to London, <laughs> off around the world. Oh, what a life you lead. <laughs> I was in Liverpool yesterday. So yeah, really making the rounds. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> Liverpool's a lovely place. My it sister's is. moving to Liverpool. So yeah. Oh, really? Don't ask me why or where. Oh, you yeah, know, it's just, you know, she's leaving Kent and going to Liverpool. Good for her. Fair enough. Well, yeah, it was lovely. It was actually the first time I've worked in the uh, in Anfield um, recording some stuff uh, many years ago. And this is the first time I'd been as a tourist. It was lovely. It is an amazing place. Yeah. Uh, there's so much to it. So, oh, good yeah. for you. Go back. Yeah. <laughs> so how's 2023 been for you so far it, it's been hectic uh, mm. uh those of you who remember i've said it many times obviously and bored people with it we're just at the back end of our big terry pratchett project at the moment mm -hmm. so we delivered over half the books are now out if i remember right there's a 40 book series and uh we were racing to get the particular one particular section of it the eight book guards series done we got four done before christmas we had four more to do after christmas plus uh, uh, the final Tiffany Aching book, uh, Moving mm -hmm. Pictures, and Pyramids. So quite a lot of books to get done. Yeah. Uh, and we dived in first week of January, uh, finished the final studio recording day last Saturday. Um, so we're now in mid-February. And I've got one more remote producing session, which is a three-day uh, to come up. And then that's it all recorded. Uh, not all delivered, of course, but all, yeah. all recorded. Uh, and so we're really heavily into post-production um, and just trying to get everything done on time for the deadlines, uh, which is always fun when deadlines, they move. They're constantly moving beasts. They're very strange things. I think Douglas Adams once famously said he loved the sound of a deadline as it whizzed past. And I was like, <laughs> yeah, quite famous for never hitting one, of course. Um, we have to. But uh, yeah, yeah it, it's being busy and obviously just trying to keep the business going at the same time. So you yeah. know, I'm focused mostly on Pratchett whilst Morrison... Uh, looks after his studio and the kind of day-to-day -day books, which I'm so, this is going to sound weird to say, you know, dream projects and all that, and oh, biggest yeah. audiobook project in the world, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. I'm so looking forward to just getting back to book by book work again, just not knowing what's coming up, not having to plan nine months down the road or give someone voice notes from a book we did seven months ago. So they know it, it, dream yeah. projects. You have to be careful what you wish for. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was going to I was going to ask because this is I mean as you say and quite rightly the biggest uh, you know audiobook production series you know that's going on at the moment is such a huge monumental task I, I was just going to ask a bit of a basic question I guess and I don't know how easy it will be to answer but what's what's been your overall experience of this is it you know like kind of how how, how have you been <laughs> during the whole production it, it's been like nothing I've ever experienced before I mean we're quite well known for doing big project work um mm. you know we've done uh the uh, Georgette Heyer 56 book series for, for Penguin a couple of years ago yeah but there's a level of expectation with Pratchett, of course. There's an existing fan base as well as their their hope to bring in a new fan base. Mm. Uh, there's all the books that have been done before. There's the TV shows uh, and the cartoons. So everyone and everyone's got a voice of a character in their head. Um, kind of famously, uh, these sorts of books, fans find any other version than the one they've grown up on to be kind of antithetical to them. It's uh, you killed my childhood stuff. <laughs> so you have all that kind of stress on you as well. Yeah as there's all this law and there's pronunciations and there's not one narrator we've had eight or nine or however many it is across the series yeah and trying to keep them all basically in line with each other roughly with the voices of the returning characters is 
not always the easiest thing because obviously mm. we're not asking people to imitate each other, but we are asking people to do something within a certain zone. Mm. And some people have already prepped before I've been able to get to them and they get quite resistant to change. Gotcha. They all do it and they're all lovely, but it's, you know, if someone walks into a studio and they've, they prepped someone to be Birmingham and you say, Oh no, they've got to be Glaswegian. It mm. takes them for a bit of a, uh, on a different journey, shall we say. Yeah, uh, but there's been a lot of good because it's nice to rediscover books I grew up on, and uh, and to do them in this format. As I've said so many times before to people, when you read a book aloud, you experience it in a way that's very different to reading it in your mind, mm -hmm. uh, or however we describe reading a book, you know, solo through our eyes. Uh, you, you have to give it a different life and performance and structure. You have to perform it. Um, and you also become aware of some of the idiosyncrasies of an author that you may never have noticed before, um, including typos. <laughs> there, there are typos in, in Pratchett. I, I can't believe after all the iterations of Pratchett, but you know, particularly some of the earlier books that are 30, 40 years old, yeah. you know, they're not terrible typos. They're just like a the or that or a missing S or something. But you notice them doing audiobooks, and it's really weird. You go, should I tell anyone? I mean, it's been there for 40 years. Maybe. Yeah. If, anyway, uh, so on that side, it's been interesting. Uh, I'm always one aware uh, to be aware of not sounding like I'm not grateful for the work I get. Um, but from the outside, it always looks, I have people say to me, oh, it must be amazing. The thing you do, oh, you get to sit there and have people read to you and you get to meet these famous people and have lunch with them and dinner with them. And then it's like, mm -hmm. yeah, okay. We can take aside the good bits of that. Hanging out, having lunch, going for dinner, all that, that's lovely. But when you're responsible for someone else on a very tight timeline to get something mm. as close to 100% accurate as possible, and it's not a thing they do every day of the week. Mm. So the people we've had on Pratchett who are incredible performers, some of them have rarely, if ever, done audio before doesn't mean they're not good at it and we haven't got a good performance out of them, but it's been hard because you're almost teaching as you go. Mm. And I would say the, the man management side, as alongside the project management side of this, this particular production, mm. has been the thing that's driven me somewhat to the edge of despair at times because audiobooks are generally considered the least important thing on a famous actor's schedule. So if suddenly an advert comes up, they'll want to skip and go off and do the advert because it might pay mm. them 15, 20, 30, 40, 50, 100,000 pounds. Who mm. knows? Uh, and obviously their agent wants them to do it. Uh, a film suddenly comes up, TV show comes up, or they finish the film or a TV show, but suddenly they're required for a reshoot or some bit of work. And of course, mm. the contract for that has priority. Mm. So suddenly we're finding our schedules being moved endlessly throughout the the last year and a half, endless movement of schedules. And it's great for them. But for us as a small business, and for me mm. as someone who has not taken on another booking, it mm. has become really difficult. We made, we made close to a loss last year as a business because we didn't do we, we maybe 20, 25 fewer books last year because I was keeping time aside for, mm. uh, for the scheduling of these people. Um, and rightly so. That's the project. That's mm. what I bought into. Fair enough. But, you know, conversations with accountants, they don't care about the fun creative bit. No. <laughs> so I have to say that going forward, any big dream project like this, again, I would have, I would probably have more robust conversations about things like scheduling and mm. cancellation fees and uh, time being paid, even if the thing doesn't happen that kind of stuff. You know, I've learned yeah. a lot, which is weird being the age I am and so far into my business, but you learn from every project you do. Yeah. Um, and none of that is to say there's been a lack of creativity and wonderfulness from those actors. They have been nothing short of incredible and friendly and lovely and apologetic and everything else, you know, yeah. but I'd say it's about to anyone, no matter whether you work in this industry or not, beware the dream project, because at some point it, it just becomes work. Yeah, you, know, you, you you've got a job to do for a certain amount of money for a certain amount of time, and it's going to get stressful, and you're not going to enjoy it for a while. 
what you have to hope is that you then bounce through on the other side like I am now. And as we're getting closer and closer to final delivery on everything, you know, I'm seeing seeing the sunshine again and enjoying promoting yeah. it and see and seeing people's reactions as the books get released and the positive, you know, the positivity for India Ravama doing the witches books is so incredible. And, and mm. all due to her, she's amazing. You know, wouldn't it be nice if someone actually wrote a nice, oh, these have been very well directed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Although you never get that one. You do get the ones where it goes, who was the idiot producer on this? <laughs> it's always the negative, never the positive. Oh, particularly yeah. for technical stuff. It's, it, yeah, you, you rarely have ever get a positive like, oh, that was so beautifully edited. <laughs> Because our, our job should be invisible. And that's what we have to remind ourselves when we do get a bit depressed about the technical side of things. And I know that's what mm. we're going to talk about today. Yeah. Uh, we are kingmakers. We're not the king. Uh, and but, they, but we're human. And so, you know, it's a mm. bit like that. Someone once asked me when I first started doing stuff for the BBC, uh, they said, why is it independent producers make such a, a big thing about making sure that they've got credits uh, at the end of the show and, and in the Radio Times? Hmm. and i thought long and i was head of the union at the time and i was thinking oh, no, no, it's got to be you know the justifiable right of creatives to be blah 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 and then at the hmm. end of it i just went you know what it's just because we want our mums to see our names or hear our names and yeah. i thought I was, I, and i said yeah, okay it might not be your mum it might be your partner your best friend whoever but in all of us there's that epic desire for someone we know to come up and go, oh, I saw your name. Or, oh, I heard that you were, it might be an old school friend who's not spoken to you for 30 years and send you a Facebook message. And go, Did I just see your name on the end of that TV show? And I yeah. can guarantee you there's not an actor in the world who doesn't enjoy being credited. I mean, good Lord, the lengths their unions go to to make sure they get credited for yeah. stuff. So I think there is an importance that we that is often underplayed particularly by our clients about why those of us who do the technical side and make the thing mm. want some form of recognition out of the process um oh, yeah it, it's strange to think why would you not want us to have it yeah. as opposed to why should we justify that we do but there are still some publishers that don't allow you to put producer and editor credits on the end of the books is there like anything, because as you say, it's so overlooked that, you know, post-production as a whole is massively overlooked from multiple areas, if not most. Um, is there anything that we can be doing in this industry to to change that? Is there, is there, is there you know, what, what would you sort of suggest that, that people sort of get wise to? First and foremost, we need technical awards. I know mm -hmm. awards, awards, blah, blah, boring, boring, yeah. haven't got the money, haven't got the time. There's very few awards for audiobooks in the UK anyway. We tend to rely oh, yeah. upon the Americans to do the award thing, and we all kind of enter and hope. Yeah. Um, you know, there's one award in the UK, Audiobook Producer of the Year, which is part of the APA awards that uh, that uh, Audio UK organize. Mm -hmm. um, and that's very kind of them. And, you know, I, I should put my hand up and say I'm one of the people who actually created the APAs all those years ago, and I'm so proud of where it sits now. Um but one award, and it's mm. only for the producer. Uh, why? Why not an editor of the year? Why not a team of the year? Why not audiobook production house of the year? You know, mm. uh, but then again, why not audiobook awards of anyway in the UK? Yeah, they just don't really exist. There doesn't seem to be an appetite for them either in the publishing industry. Who, let's be honest, would have to help us pay for them because you know they've got the cash. Yeah, uh, or the industry as a whole. Uh, I suppose because we don't have a central resource in the UK for championing audiobooks. We again we tend to rely on the US outlets like Audiophile magazine to mm. kind of be that thing. A bookseller would be the one within the trade, but again, not all that interested in audiobooks and too much about it. And they uh, fairly controversial to say it probably, and I'll be careful how I word it, but they do tend to do more articles to do with AI and yeah. and, and other such issues because they're being paid by those companies as either advertisers or mm. I don't know, you know, editor paid editorial, whatever it might be. Um, mm. And maybe that's our failure. Maybe the UK is still very much a, uh, like a cottage industry over mm. here, uh, a bit more unionized in America. And obviously sag after the union in America is much stronger uh, than equity is in the UK, but even so equity represents the talent I hate that word, the narrators um, performers rather than the unions. There's no single, point of uh, representation for producers editors 
composers, proofers. Yeah. Uh, we've tried it with the ACA. It's not really something people are that interested in in having, or at least not that interested in helping to create, mm. which is a little depressing. Yeah. Um, I ended up finally, after 30 years of joining Beck2 as a union, uh, but I had to have a long conversation with them about the fact that I basically work for myself. So it's like I had to put a statement that said, well, of course, I won't go on strike against myself. <laughs> I was like, well, yeah, <laughs> no, true. That's kind of not what i have kind of joining back to, to maybe be someone to talk to you about what audiobook representation could look like in the future. But anyway, it's, it's yeah. nice to be part of a union just so if nothing else, you can join your fellow unionists and, uh, and stand against the man. Yeah. But I think, I, I think we need something like that. We need, we need to make sure that every publisher gives technical credits at the end of every book. Mm -hmm. I would like to see Audible, and I'd like to see iTunes and Google Play uh, and the other big platforms include technical credits on their website pages. What does it hurt? It, mm -hmm. Let's put it this way. The BBC always used to argue that we don't want long credits at the end of radio shows or dramas because the audience aren't really that interested. They just came for the content. They want the next thing to start immediately. So unless you can fit your credits, unless it's a drama, but in documentaries, unless you can fit your credits into like a 13-second window, mm. you, know, you can't have them. And we mm. all kind of accepted it. It's utter rubbish, but we all kind of accept it. Hence, you know, on TV where they minimize the credits and speed them up. You know, yeah. so they, they've ticked a legal box, but yeah, it's, yeah. Not, it's a bit rude. Uh, in audio books, it's like, well, if you don't want to hear the credits, just just stop. Yeah. It's, it's not like we're putting the credits midway through and forcing you to listen to them before the reveal of the murderer. I mean, I'd love to do that. Be brutal. <laughs> <laughs> like, My Lord, the murderer is. And there'd be a long pause. It's like, produced by Neil and edited by Steve. <laughs> <laughs> Bob kills the murderer. It'd be brilliant, but no, we're not asking for that. It's, it's, you know, audio books, you, people just stop. You don't need to listen to it. So if, yeah. they, if that were the argument, why would you leave on all the pointless copyright information, which yeah. I mean, isn't pointless, it's legal, but at the same time, it's boring. Yeah, exactly. It's not for the content. Yeah. No one's listening for it. It's just there because some lawyer says it has to be there. So in which case, why not bung us on it as well? Yeah. Um, you know, or there's a couple of publishers who don't mind you naming the producer and editor, but you can't say your company name. So it's like, yeah, I just put it in anyway, because it's not like they're going to listen. And if they do, they can edit it out. But it's like, yeah. but you have hired Labrick Audio. And so those two people work for Labrick Audio. So we are the ones who have done the work. No yeah. one's going to sit there, get to the end of the audio book and go, what? Harper Collins didn't actually record and edit this book themselves. It's like, no one cares. Mm. So I think if we can get it at least to a point where the industry itself recognizes its technical people in terms of crediting, mm. then that, that's a nice step forward. It's a something. It's, it's just a recognition and have an award or two. You know, yeah. we all know TV and movies have technical awards. They don't show that bit. They might show the best cinematographer. Uh, or best special effects because it's interesting it's visually interesting but mm. the paparazzi aren't there to take red carpet photographs of of dave the key grip who just won you know key grip of the year they're not interested in him unless he happens to be dating some famous actress yeah, or yeah, actor, yeah. you know but that's fine they still get the award they get their night out you know the industry gives them a round of applause a couple of famous people give them something and they all feel you know represented yeah in, in some way I don't think technical people in audiobooks feel represented at all. No, not at all. I certainly don't. I don't. I, you know, I have to. We have to self-represent. Now, nothing wrong with that. We all like to hustle. It's a great industry. All, all the actors yeah. do this. All the narrators do this. But I'd like them. I'd like. Where's best UK audiobook narrator? Hmm. Yeah, the only place for that is the One Voice Awards, uh, and great for them. That's free as well. Even better. Uh, although the party to go to for the awards isn't, but uh, it's worth it just for the bad singing and the karaoke yeah. and the dancing. Um, and the ladies in beautiful frocks and the men in lovely penguin suits. It's all very fun, uh, <laughs> worth the money. But but there's not much that allows us to come together a few times a year to celebrate the joy of British audiobook yeah. production in a way the Americans are so good at it. They are so good at representing their industry and having parties and meeting each other, you know? Yeah. 
I was going to say the, the the difference between you know you I mean the, the difference across all the borders you know you can talk about payment or you know the way that they do their projects over there but as you say the acknowledgement seems to be so much better over in the states and as you say in the UK it's just not it doesn't seem to be there I don't know if that's through the lack of organizations who are putting things forward I, I suppose it is um, but even like down to like social meetups and things like that other than maybe eight or nine people in a pub and it's just through you know twitter dms and stuff there's not even big any sort of official meetups or anything like that at the uk side i mean the pub thing is very british i mean that, yeah. let's not disparage <laughs> eight or nine people no no, no no yeah let's be doctor who survived in its dead years because of about 10 people meeting up in the fitzrovia pub and meeting each other and they were the people who then later on the bbc went to to reboot and relaunch doctor who you know yeah. the guys the guys from big finish and, and russell t davis and all those guys they were all in that pub one thursday every month in central london just to talk doctor who so mm. it can work you know uh, and yeah. it is british you know we love a good oh, yeah, yeah. So what, what the heck but you're absolutely right when you look around there is there's very little things tend to bounce off of the occasional event of course and and uh, and I'll say this in UK, what, what is done very well is the VO side of stuff. So if you're into commercial and corporate VO work, then some of the work that particularly people like Rachel Naylor do mm. uh, and the One Voice uh, people do, the Gravy for the Brain organize, mm. um, you know, Vond and all that sort of stuff, it, that's very good. It happens three or four times a year. You know, They get a good old slap on and dress up and have a good old party. But again... I think that's because there's lots of money in the VO industry in terms of comparison to the to the audiobook industry. So there are people who can afford those kind of parties. There are people that are willing to take time out to go and do those kind of parties. There mm. are organizations who can put together those all because they've got sponsors and backers and bigger businesses that are interested in throwing a few thousand pounds towards a party. Mm. Audiobooks, there's no one. I have tried for many many years to get sponsorship and backer not that, that the people such as the audibles and the publishers as well don't put money into supporting the industry they absolutely do but again there's no big thing there's no real big push for it equity yeah. up until covid would try and do something once or twice a year and it'd always be very nice but extremely busy because it because it'd be one of the few things that happened specifically for audiobook people You'd have like 100, 150 people turn up for a space that could maybe only just about take 150 people. And, yeah. you know, we all know we work in voice. We know how loud those spaces get. And you end up getting stuck in a corner and just, just speaking to the same six people. And, you know, the people who've come who are like me, who would come along as a producer, would everyone be like, oh, there's a producer. Oh, I must give him my business card. I must, like, oh, man, I just <laughs> and then we maybe have like a half hour meet the producer bit. And then everyone else just just let. I'm here trying to pick up women, honestly. You know what I mean? like, there must be one single actress here because, you know, I, I, I want a date. You know, that, yeah, that go to side. Yeah, you know, I felt, oh, actually, used to feel quite sorry for the publishers who would, who would try to turn up. But the second mm. song, you know, there was like, it, it, was, it was like hunting time. Oh, mm. there's the guy from Audible. There, there's the girl from Harper. It's like, oh, you yeah. poor things. It's like, just back. Yes, we know you're actors. We know you want a book. It's like, we, we get it. You know, but yeah. But at least they happened, and good on equity for trying to do it. Um, it's a hard thing to organize, uh, trying to organize the ACA. I, I'm, I don't know. I mean, I'm happy to talk about it here, but I don't know if the ACA is going to continue because simply because no one else wants to put any time into it. And it takes, you know, the reason why PANA in America is doing so well is because they've been able to organize a proper committee. Each yeah. person's got a job to do. Um, the membership are willing to pay, which my lot aren't. So they can afford to do things. Uh, and again, Americans particularly are very motivated in terms of hustle and self-promotion and the push. Mm. You know, they, they're very good at the push. Mm. And I don't know if we are necessarily. I know lots of people in our industry are very good hustlers, are very good at self-promotion, are very good at uh, particularly the social media side of, look what I've done. Yeah. But I don't know that there's many people, and this was the same in the radio industry before, that many people that are that good at stepping outside of their own bit of the industry and trying to represent the entirety of the industry. Mm. Because what are they going to get out of it? And I'm not damning anyone for that. I've, mm. I've fallen into the same trap. You know, I launched the ACA with all that behind me, having done it two or three times before. But I've kind of run out of steam because yeah. it's like, well, no one else is stepping up to help. 
No one seems to see it as a positive. No, no one in the UK seems to want, let's call it a trade body, not a union, or a representative body that says, this could all be a little bit better. I think we've all we've all got a bit stuck in our, oh, thank God I've got a job. Yeah. You know, and oh, then, yeah. I don't want to do anything too difficult because that might get in the way of me being able to earn just about enough. To, but, you know, the UK is in a bad state at the moment. Yeah, and for those people who work in the audiobook industry where the money is atrocious, and I'm happy mm. to say it, and I don't care which of my clients hear it, you mm. know, the money for narrators is absolutely awful. And then double that terribleness for the technical people. You know, yeah, we're, I, I, we're, we're, we're hanging on by the tips of our fingernails. And I know the publishers don't have a massive pot of money either. I'm not blaming them on that level because the UK side of the industry is a much smaller pond better word for it probably than the u.s side uh but then you know so many of the books we produce in the uk on uk rates are being sold internationally and in all markets you know so often mm. we get asked to record two sets of credits a, a uk and a u.s but neither us or the narrator has been given any additional money from the u.s publisher yeah so again it's it's interesting all these things are linked together unfortunately as always is you know money yeah. is the, the bottom of everything or the top of everything depending upon how well you're being paid and so much is relying on this idea of well there's always someone else who'll do it and there is you know if labbrook suddenly put our hands up and said look we need double then we would never get any more work again because i know nearly every other studio would go oh labbrook are asking for double and you'll say no that's fine we'll take the work we can keep going we'll keep going we'll keep taking it we'll keep managing don't worry um and that's just the politics and reality mm. of running small businesses. You know, you can't price yourself out of the market. But at the same time, we can't push the market rate up very high either for ourselves. Yeah. Um, and that's a real shame because I would love to pay proofers double what they get at the moment. I think proofers are the, um, I think I mentioned this on our last interview, but proofers just don't get recognized. I mean, at least mm. half of the books that get made have a producer credit. And then half of those have an editor credit. No one gets proofer credit. No. Now, a lot of proofers I've asked about this say we don't want credit. <laughs> <laughs> right, not sure what you're so scared of, but okay, fair enough. Uh, but even within the industry, you know, it's like these people are gold. They're beyond yeah. gold. They're whatever the rarest, they're adamantium or whatever the rarest thing on the planet is. Vibranium, yeah. you know, that or, uh, what's the one in Avatar? Unobtainium. You know, they're that, they're unobtainium. Th then again, there are people who do audiobooks and don't use a proofer. Blows my mind. I keep getting chased at the moment by Positron about, oh, oh we believe in humans, but this our thing is so handy. It just helps. It's, yeah, I know. I know Positron can be very helpful. Yeah. But I believe in human beings. Yeah. I want to hire him and I want to pay them a fair amount. But the industry won't let me. Yeah, you know, the money's mm -hmm. just not there. If I want to double their fee, and I'll be absolute honest truth with you, mate. If I change from £15 per finished hour to £30 per finished hour, I make a loss. Yeah. That's my profit margin. It's not even that. It's not even £15 per finished hour. If I'm lucky, it's five. Hmm. I can't afford to. The only way I can is if the largesse of the publisher are going, you know what, as a whole, as an industry, we should be making sure that these people get paid a decent amount because we all rely on them. There's no one at the publisher listening to the audio book when it's delivered. Well, hmm. occasionally there is, you know, um, and a few of the publishers send it out for second proof as well, which is very bold of them and very exciting. Slightly annoying sometimes <laughs> when you've missed something, but fair enough. We're all but human. Uh <laughs> But again, it's like, well, if you can afford to double proof, why don't we just really pay well for the first proof? Yeah. Anyway, very boring for the listeners, this stuff. I don't I don't think so. I think it's really important. And I think I think if they're listening to this podcast anyway, that's of interest to them. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you're a proofer, yay. <laughs> yeah, think... it's it, it's important. You know, payment is always a dull thing to talk about in one way because some people think you're complaining and you shouldn't be complaining. And some people are completely mm. agree with you. And other people think, well, you're just laying one person off against another person. And, you know, who's doing, mm. more, should talent always earn more than production, et cetera? Yeah. Who knows? You know, in, in an ideal sandal wearing, guardian reading, tofu eating world, we all get paid, <laughs> you know, 500 pounds per finished second and we'd all live on an island of cats. It'd be fantastic. <laughs> but, or dogs or, or tortoises, whatever you're into. Yeah. 
but we won't. And reality is reality. Business is business. But I would like the role of the producer director, even evenly. This is where I came from. I shouldn't say evenly. Mm. Uh, those jobs where it's where you're working with an engineer whose job is solely just to press start, press stop, and just make sure the thing sounds okay. They've got no, mm. re, there's no need for them to do more than that. But but that role, yeah. You know, anyone who's involved in delivering the book from the page to the ear should be treated better and should yeah. be respected better and heard about better. Mm -hmm. um, I know there's going to at least two people I know if they hear this will be screaming, no, I don't want people to know who I am. <laughs> <laughs> and so like, that's fine. You don't have to, if you don't want to be credited. Yeah. Great. That's up to you completely. But yeah. if you, if you do, and if you do want an opportunity to go out for a party, here's something. I think that the schedule of the production team should be given as much importance and weight by the client as the schedule of the talent, where possible. Of course, we understand, particularly with A-listers and celebrities and people that are doing big filming projects, that they have a bigger schedule than us. And so we try our best to work around them. But when the schedule of the talent is always given first priority, rather than a discussion of the schedule of both sides, mm -hmm it becomes insulting to those of us on our side of it. So, oh, you just telling us that thing's now been cancelled and we must now find another date for it. Hmm. You're not respecting the fact that I therefore cannot do another job because that's tomorrow and I can't book something else in and you're not paying me a cancellation fee, et cetera, et cetera. It's, like, it's just, and you're, you're given this expectation of, well, yeah, but their talent, we've got, yeah, but, you know, you know, hmm. it's the, yeah, it's them, isn't it? You know, it's like, yeah, I do know. And the person as a person, as a down a pub person, I love dearly, they're wonderful, but them as a concept yes. is really aggravating. It's like, yes. we're, we're not all beholden to you. It's not some kind of monarchy. We don't have to bow before the all great talent. It's like, you know what? Come talk to me when you can build a studio, set it up, re run it edit it, master the thing, and get the thing out to bizarre, exotic mm -hmm. specifications in the same way that I do not consider that I am in any way on your level as an actor. Yeah. And I just think if we can get to a stage where, on the understanding, of course, that people like me, we are selling a service, and so therefore we try to be the most flexible people in, in the chain. Yeah. But at least if you as a client, whoever you may be, can come to the table with a, with a, a willingness to say, Everybody I'm hiring from the actor who or narrator or performer through to the proofer are equally as important as one another. Yeah. You know, and of course, this is a problem that's plagued entertainment since day one. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. Ask anyone who works on a film set, anyone who works on a TV set, you know, you're yeah. expected to get there two hours before the talent. You get, you get, you don't get a private car. You don't get a trailer. You don't get mm. lunch, you know, and you expect it to be there two hours afterwards and you're on one one hundredth of what they're getting paid yeah. and you get shouted at and told oh, yeah. off and everything else, you know, it can be hell. Yeah. But you go into those jobs knowing that, of course, the person at the top of the billing is the person who's helping to sell the product. And mm -hmm. without them, there wouldn't be a job for you to turn up two hours early for and be shouted at. So we get that. Technical people mm -hmm. get that. We know we're kingmakers. We know that we are there occasionally, like, unfortunately, to be shouted and screamed at, even though it's not our fault, although sometimes it absolutely is our fault. <laughs> <laughs> but but that's as it ever was. But in audiobooks, which is such a small thing, you know, there's a there, there's the person who books the book, that's whatever the client is, oh, I hit my microphone, whoever the person is, whoever the client is, the client. So they've got the money, the person with, with the project. And then in essence, there's, a narrator, one person, a producer director, one person, an editor, one person, proofer, one. So four people. Mm -hmm. Now, actually, the editor <laughs> might also be the producer director. The editor might also be the proofer. So it could be three people. Yeah. There's no other industry outside of live commercial radio where there's just one DJ, where there's such a small team delivering a product even an author unless you're self-publishing will have an editor a proofreader a, you know a marketing but there'll be mm. a team behind that book yeah but for us it's just that it's that little bit so how hard is it to elevate the whole group and go this is how audiobooks are made these mm. small dedicated really badly paid people 
uh, and and they do it for love and passion and they really get intense for a few weeks of their life they give it their all and they want to please the author and please the listener and please the publisher uh let's go yay aren't they amazing uh, and then give them a bit more money <laughs> are you hopeful for the future of this industry especially like specifically in the uk i know there's the whole ai topic as well which will come into this but i just wondered on on a front do you see this as progress to be made are you are you, are you sort of optimistic about this uh, you know by nature on the studio side of things i worry mm. uh pre-pandemic studios are in a good place post-pandemic so many people have got really well-built, developed home setups now, which on the one side could be handy to us because it means if we have somebody who needs to do retakes, they don't have to come all the way back to the studio. And mm. for some people who have specific language abilities or accent abilities, they, they you know, we, we can hire them and their studio and we don't have to try and get them down to us at our studio. That That's all great. Mm. But it has change the industry you know publishers pre-pandemic rarely would accept someone home recording unless you could prove you'd built the most perfect studio now you know there, there are whole sections of the audiobook publishing industry that won't go near studio-based recordings unless they have to because they mm. perceive us as being more expensive well that's because there's a marketplace for underpriced undervalued home recordists yeah. You know, now, I I will never damn someone for taking a job at the price they can get. If you need to pay your bills and you're willing to do a stupid amount of work for a stupidly small fee, that's your choice. But do recognize you're damaging the industry at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, in the same way that I wouldn't damn someone for getting thousands of pounds per finished hour. If you can get it, get it. Go for it. You do what you do. You're your own business person. So good mm -hmm. for you. But as a whole, I am fearful for studio-based audiobook work. I'm not sure how my, how many more years we have ahead of us where the accountants at the publishers will allow them to do anything outside of big celebrity stuff at studios mm -hmm. that aren't owned by them. You know, we right. see more and more. Har uh, uh, Hachette have got big studios in London. Penguin have just built... Uh, a, a load of studios in London. Audible yeah. have studios in London. Uh, Harper have their own studios in London. Um, I'm sure some of the others do. I don't know where Simon and Schuster record, but I'm sure they probably do. Although they might be part of um, Pachette, so I'm, I'm not quite mm -hmm. sure. But you know, more and more, you can see where if, if we're going to build a hundred thousand pounds worth of studio in our office block in London, the accountants are going to be honest to make sure we use the damn things. Of course they are. Yeah, I can't mm. can't complain about that. But it does mean less and less for us, for those of us who have built our studios and been running our studios for all these years. Mm. Or you end up getting into situations where they come and ask you to do the job, but a really low fee. And like, oh, we just need. Sorry, yeah, this one's budgeted a bit lower. Is that okay? I said, like, well, I'm not getting anything else from you, so I'm going to have to say yes, but I might as well just shut because otherwise I'm making a loss on this project. Yeah. And what's the point of that? So I do fear that independent studio-based audiobooks, not a long way off, maybe five years before we are having to ask big questions of ourselves. I don't think places like Labbrooks that basically only do audiobooks will be able to survive. Um, I really don't. I just think the quality mm. of home booths and the ability to afford them and set them up is going to be difficult. So unless people like us diversify more and do other work, mm. uh, we'll be in trouble in that way. Uh, maybe we end up just being an editing and post-production house or something like that. Bigger studios, mm. I think, because they've got other work coming in and they're, they're generally doing audiobook work as a loss leader. I think they're fine. They're, they'll keep going as long. But th there's already been some big, big studios in London who have pared back their audiobook work uh, to give them more time and space to do VO work, corporate work, uh, film work, dubbing, because there's just no money in it for them. And let's be honest, it has to come down to cash. Yeah, you know, we, we all love our artwork and we all love being the voice of X, Y and Z. But eventually it's got to pay for the cat food uh, or pay for the mortgage or whatever it is you've got to pay for. And, you know, it, it feels dirty in the UK to talk about it that way. But, you know, all art pays for something. Absolutely. So, you know, yeah. uh, and it may not be every project pays for everything, but the purpose of creating art is to pay for things uh, and, and obviously get stuff out of your soul and be all fluffy and lovely and gorgeous and wibbly, uh, which is lovely. You know, it's the joy of what we do is that we get, okay, it's a weird way of putting it. We get to struggle financially to enrich our souls. <laughs> yeah. Uh, 
<laughs> but we get to enrich our souls. I've had a friend of mine who, who who's never been creative in his entire life, does what you and I would think of as quite a mundane, businessy job. I sort yeah. of, I couldn't do it. I mean, I keep saying to him, you do realize how clever and talented you are. It's just not in a creative way. You're in a business way. Yeah. You can do that. You can see things. You can like, it's like you know, that beautiful mind film where you can see the numbers. This guy mm. can see things that I don't even know exist uh, and make things. Happen. So you're talented. You're just differently talented, you know? Yeah. But he always goes on about the fact that, oh, you know, I, I make quite good money, but you seem to be having more fun. And part of me wants to go, yeah, 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 take away the mask, mate. Uh, coming on, uh, coming at eight o'clock on, on a Saturday evening when we're still recording and struggling. Uh, yeah. But but no, yes, we are because we are getting to play in these universes and be literary and you know, sometimes mm -hmm. do something with sound design and music and play, do a kids thing or a Doctor Who thing. Yeah, 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 absolutely. I, I, I adore that, that, all that is brilliant. And and he, he's things like well I maybe I could balance up more maybe I should write a book or maybe I should do it. and like, no, listen if you want to do all that creative stuff fine but I can guarantee you that nine out of ten of us on this side of that that equation are staring quite enviously at your bank account yeah and wondering maybe I should just go work in an office you know yeah. maybe maybe I should drive a bus or you know I, I went past Tesco's recently and their their, their minimum job that they were offering was 36,000 pounds a year that's good money I mean it's not yeah. it's terrible money but compared to iron it's good money uh, and yeah it's an interesting thing isn't it you know, mm. we, we we all have this we, we all consider the benefits of what we do and what we get oh from. yeah um so I do worry I worry about small studios uh as for the AI thing it's going to happen. It's going to happen, man. It's going to. Ha it's already happening. Yeah. Uh, the smaller publishers, the ed educational publishers, those on the fringes, they need AI. They can't afford us unless they go for the absolute cheapest of the cheapest of the cheap. And even then, you know, if you're talking about an average of an audio book for five hundred dollars, but I can see, I don't know many people who could narrate, produce, edit, master, and deliver a full educational textbook for five hundred dollars. Yeah. It's just an impossibility. You might want to, you might try to, you might love to try and do it. But after one or two, you, your accountant, your partner, your cat is going to go. Hmm. You're losing money, mate. So I get why it's developing so fast in those areas. And the thing is, in a year's time, it's going to be perfect. You know, the machine learning that's going on at the moment, whether it's naughty machine learning that shouldn't be happening, thanks to Apple and find away voices and, you know, yeah, or the shock, uh, you know, whether it's that or it's just it, it's licensed machine learning going on in the background. People are selling their voices to libraries. And again, mm -hmm. if that's what they choose to do, that's what they choose to do. It's going to get right now. I've tried some of the most advanced ones. And the only thing that's not quite getting right outside of a few inflections and personal traits is breaths you know because it's a computer it hasn't learned yet where to put in random breaths and once it's got that i think we're gonna find it very difficult to tell on a on a standard audiobook that doesn't need big voices and creativity whether mm. it's machine or human and it's going to be able to do it for, and what's really worrying from my perspective is not even that it's the fact that these things are also there's ai editing and ai proofing and yeah. ai mastering so you don't need any of us even at the back end of it tidying it up and them you know, in a year or two we'll all be got all the jobs will be done mm. by one ai uh and that's worrying now will big publishers make a thing of this yeah they're gonna there's gonna be a bit and it's already kind of there but I, let's imagine a big shiny sticker that basically says human red that is gonna be the selling point in a few years time for audiobooks it's going to be mm. not that it used to be the differentiator was abridged and unabridged you know nowadays yeah. it's like the terry pratchett thing never all of them have never been done before unabridged so it's a selling point a couple of years time it's going to be read by a human human read amazing mm. oh my lord there's a human being and it'll be like, and that's people will choose they'll choose their camp they're just looking for a fast, quick, educational listen. Don't care. They yeah. really want Hitchhiker's Guide read with masses of personality and Carol or, 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 or any, anything. Oh, look, Stephen Fry, not the AI versions, read it. Brilliant. Yeah. Great. Let's dive in. I really want that. That's where my money goes. That's going to be an interesting four or five years as we go through that period. What yeah. happens after that? No idea. Because at some point, as with everything, accountants take control. 
And when accountants just look at the numbers, that's their job. I'm not mm. going to damn accountants for doing their job. That's why we pay them. But they're going to go, why did we spend £5,000 on an audiobook? Uh, let's say not, a, uh, yeah, a long audiobook, but a standard audiobook, when we could have done it for 2000 using AI. And it sounds exactly the same because it's not a big, flashy Stephen Fry book. Yeah. And the budgets will change. The process will change. I don't, I, I'm not doom laden about it. They will always be famous people reading books because, yeah. it go, you know, look at the Grammys. Who always wins the audiobook at the Grammys? It's the big famous person. You know, oh, someone's written a memoir and read a memoir and great, brilliant, well done. But they won the Grammy for it. I mean, yeah. I can guarantee you the Grammy should go to the editor because I could bet you anything they were terrible in the studio <laughs> because they don't do it for a living. You know, they're a singer or a writer or an actor. Yeah. They can do that really, really well. But put something in front of a microphone who's never done it before. It takes a lot of editing, a lot of yeah. post-production. So, you know, the Grammy should come with a little mini Grammy that goes to the editor or the producer or the production team. So they can have mm -hmm. a little, <laughs> like comes out the base or something. You open the little door up and there's a little mini Grammy inside it. But of course it promotes the industry. Oh my Lord, Rihanna's not just pregnant. She's done an audio book about being pregnant. You yeah. know, everyone goes off and starts buying audio books. I mean, whether or not they buy anything other than Rihanna's book about being pregnant, yeah, yeah. Uh, who knows? But yeah. if it takes you, if it gets you a subscription to a service, you're more than likely, at least for that first year, whilst you can't cancel it, to make use mm. of it. So that's great. You know, again, it goes back to why the Audible use Stephen Fry so much. You know, I guarantee it's not because he's cost effective. It, it's simply, apart from that, he's talented and lovely and wonderful to work with, but he shifts subscriptions. Yeah. If you want to hear him reading Conan Doyle for 80 hours, you have to subscribe, you know, and yeah. people did and do. And that's amazing. It's a great way of doing audiobooks. Do you think like directing more publicity then towards audiobooks and, and the entire industry is the way to go? Um, like for instance, with the Prince Harry book that came out at the start of the year, I know that Audible jumped up in subscription for people listening to their first ever audiobook. Um, with that being that, do you and do you think that was? Uh, and then they've stuck around for a few more months to to see what this audiobook thing is about. Do you think that is going to be key to maybe sort of stabilizing this for the for the immediate future? I know you're probably not going to have yeah, right, because you know you're not going to have AI yeah. read you know, Meghan Markle's private diaries or something. Yeah. You know, if it's going to happen, it's going to be Meghan doing it. Yeah. You know, the the, the A-list of reading audiobooks thing, which has been around for, I mean, prominently around for five or six years now. Yeah, it's a marketing stunt. And we all know mm. it's a marketing stunt, so we don't get annoyed by it, apart from when the annual round of, uh, of high-profile awards or the annual round of uh, news articles about audiobooks being a $5 billion industry. Yeah, you know, Danes to 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 suggest that uh, you know famous actress number one has has come down to the world of audiobooks because oh audiobooks are so hip and fan. No, they got paid fifty thousand dollars to do it. You know they didn't do it at a hundred dollars per finished hour. Yeah, you know, they did it because it's a marketing stunt. It's been paid for by the publisher or the audiobook company out of advertising and marketing. Now, no problem with that. I can guarantee you that the producer didn't get paid that level. <laughs> I've yeah. done those jobs. You know, we we yeah. we get the 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 chocolate end of the stick. Uh, to to, to slightly change the phrase because, <laughs> because it's just you know, and that's fine. But it'd be nice if on a high profile job it was recognised that it's important. So therefore, maybe everyone on the job should get a little boost to encourage them to do their finest work. Mm -hmm. But yes, that will always stay human. Um, I am waiting, though. I am definitely waiting for the first, um, uh, what would you call it, uh, audio book read by an AI voice of a dead celebrity. So mm. a couple of celebrities have sold their voice libraries. They're getting on in age. They've sold their voice libraries to these big AI companies. You just wait. You just wait. Let's say that they, they, they didn't finish their memoir before they pass their husband, wife, partner, agent finishes the book off, puts the last couple of chapters in. That happens all the time, the posthumous mm. memoir. And then up to now, you'd either get someone who's a sound alike, or normally you get another actor who's within the realm, the zone, the, the, mm. the oeuvre of that original actor as a kind of nod and a wink and a she was my friend, whatever kind of way to read it. 
Yeah. Um, and you don't pretend otherwise. You just go, and we've got this person who knew that person to read it because that person's dead. Hmm. When are we going to get the first AI generated from a library, memoir, or whatever? Hmm. That's going to be fascinating. You know, we've yeah. got it in films. We've, we know, we've had, oh, the, yeah, Steve yeah. McQueen, we've had the Steve McQueen thing. We've had the uh, Christopher Princess Leia. Leia. Uh, Princess Leia. And yeah, mostly Star Wars. But obviously, advertising has been doing it for about 10 years. Yeah. Um, you know, there's been some questionable uses of AI audio, uh, reconstructing people from other banks of recordings to finish off something when they've passed away or refused mm. to do it or whatever it was. So that's going to be fascinating because there's no other way you can do it. And if you want it to be famous person reading their book mm. now, that's fine. But when is it gets licensed? Famous person who's dead is now reading a, another person's book. Yeah. Well, that's going to be creepy. That's going to be yeah. weird. Um, Controversial, I imagine, at the start. Well, but the thing is, it's estates. The estate will agree whether or yeah. not it's something that person would have wanted to have done. Yeah. And in essence, they've got the right. They've got the license. They've done the deal. The rest mm. of us just have to say, what can we do? It's like the de-aging of Mark Hamill to be Luke Skywalker again in, in uh, Boba Fett, Mandalorian, whichever one it was. Yeah. It's like, listen, if Mark was happy for it to happen and he still got the job of coming on set and doing all the body work, yeah. you know, and it wasn't against his wishes, fine. But let's, you know, someday that joy that is Mark Hamill will not be with us anymore. Mm. But Disney will still be churning out terrible star wars no doubt and will they be able to do more mark hamill as luke skywalker because of yeah. deep fake and ai and yeah blah 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 blah, blah. who knows you know all these yeah. things come along now in audio books will ai destroy our world no of course it won't will it make a lot of us redundant yeah i think it probably will but mostly on the edges at the moment. I think we're at least 10 years away from mainline publishers not wanting real people to do stuff. For yeah. Them. But it's going to push us on price, which is worrying. It's going to push us on speed. There will be, I think, around the edges, there will be pressure to say, why are you using a human proofer when Positron could be doing it literally as you're recording? There'll be a point mm. when you can have Positron in your stream as you're recording, basically being a producer. It, yeah. You know, picking yeah. stuff up. It's going to get there because they're pumping so much money into it. So that's going to be interesting. You know, I think it's more likely that producers and edit producers, editors, and proofers are going to be replaced before narrators on mass by, by this technology. Mm. Uh, but again, I, I think your main line publishers are always going to want to be able to say, here's Dave. Uh, he's our head editor. Here's Susan. She's our lead director. You know, they like that. It's mm. a selling point, you know. And, yeah. And you're going to always going to need those people because when you do have celebrity coming in to do your famous new version of Winnie the Pooh, then, you know, they, they expect to see someone who can guide them through it because they've yeah. probably not read the book. They've not prepped. There's no information. They need you to save their bacon. So, yeah. you know, having a well-experienced, this is from experience, you know, a, a well-experienced director who's ready for all those kind of things is going to be very important. You know, not, not, mm. I don't think there'll ever be a day when you can rely on, on a performer coming in and just being able to do it. Yeah. You know, I mean, there are people I can tell you I would rely on to do that because they're superb and they're day-to-day -day audiobook narrators who know their job and know what they're doing. Yeah. But publishers do like their famous names because it sells. Um, and they either and i want to be fair to them generally don't have time to do a lot of that kind of prep work um so they will have a tendency to turn up and yeah, it's weird on the best day it's really strange when it's their own book <laughs> it's, like, it's like people turn up and they go i uh, i didn't i no, that didn't happen and you're like but you wrote the book and I'm like well obviously a ghostwriter wrote the book yeah but you checked it didn't you well i haven't read it yet <laughs> you realize uh, the thing's actually coming out in the shop next week you can't change any of this yeah that's that one blows wow. me away as a director it's like how can i mean i get weirded out when any performer turns up in the studio and they've not prepared but yeah. when it's your own material yeah and you're not prepared <laughs> So it's not in the fact that you, you didn't write it, but you also didn't read it, is it? <laughs> I presume. I mean, they always say, oh, I did go through it and I did double check. But it's like, well, clearly yeah. not. 
Yeah. Clearly not. You know, when when half the names are wrong, when the dates are wrong, when yeah. when when the meaning you're trying to get across is wrong, clearly you've not proved yeah. this before. You know, you, you yeah, it's like but you know, that's always the hilarity we get to have fun yeah. man managing that process. <laughs> <laughs> I did want to uh, I did want to ask so you mentioned with the ACA and you you mentioned how it's kind of like a, an uphill battle at the moment because you're kind of on your own and you haven't got that um you haven't got the support of people stepping up. Um, and sort of assisting you in in that movement, much like the US seem to have uh, with their committees and their d- d- whatever else they have. I just kind of wondered: have you sort of like have you have you reached out to people? Have you plans to reach out to people in the future to to gather a committee? Is there anything that our listeners can maybe do to help or assist or anything like that? Yeah. So I take full responsibility for the ACA floundering. Uh, I just ran out of time mm. to do it all on my own. So what I decided to do towards the end of last year was to reset it. So out of my own pocket, I paid for a complete overhaul of its website and its resources um, so that it would be an exciting relaunch point for people. Mm-hmm. Uh, when we did the shift across and moved the membership over, we lost about 50% of our members, uh, which was a worry considering it's free. Uh, yeah. you, where you go there. But Again, when you ask people why, they were like, well, what's the purpose of this? We were Mm. either already a member of PANA, uh, which is very active and it gives us lots of stuff. It's like, well, Mm. yeah, you pay them quite a large fee and there's lots of you so they can they can buy stuff in. But they're great people and they work really hard. Or it was like, well, you're not really doing anything. So I'm not really sure. Mm. It's like, Well, it's because when we ask you what you want us to do, no one replies. So Mm. I think the reality is. The point of the ACA was to say, look, narrators are are, res- are are respected and represented by equity. The technical people aren't. There's no point setting up a technical person's union trade body group because none of the unions are interested. Uh, and um, there's no single source for us to uh, represent ourselves against. Yeah. So the, the publishers aren't a single block. The clients aren't a single block. It's, it's, a, it's a difficult strike. But also there's very few of us. We're all in direct competition <clears throat> in the same way narrators are. Um, and the reality is, if you do try this, then the clients are just going to pit you against each other. What's the best way of getting something off the ground? So Dawn, it made me think, okay, well, the one thing that narrators always want is is for us to support them to say, you know, they get, we get invited to equity events. We get asked to speak on their behalf. What's it like working with them? Should they get paid more? What their rights should be? You know, they get all the good union stuff. So I thought, okay, if we could get all the technical people to say on mass, yes, we absolutely agree that you should all be paid more, get more credit, have more fun, free chocolate bars, whatever it is that you want. That's great because there's say there's a hundred technical people. There's, a thousand narrators hmm. let's get then in return a thousand narrators all turn around and say yeah but you lot get quite a dodgy deal as well so yeah we'll, we'll back you up hence the ACA, the idea that everyone who gets paid to make audiobooks works together hmm. to uplift the industry and it's not just about money and rights and credits and stuff it is about best practice trying to fight against some of the really weird things that the industry does such as this kind of unilateral decision to go down a spotify rms mastering route which makes no sense whatsoever Mm. um and not allowing us to be split as a as a cottage industry we're so easy to split and fight against ourselves it's an age-old tactic it's why unions exist you know, it's why we formed what was the Radio Independence Group, now Audio UK, to say to the BBC as our biggest client, you know what, you need to treat independent producers better. And on this one thing, we're going to stand together. You know, you're not going to split us between the big guys and the little guys. And it worked. It was a lot of hard work. But because everyone could see the value of it, all the indies bought in, put a bit of money in, put people up on the committee, brought different experts they knew in. And, you know, it's a four-year thing, but we got there and we got new terms of trade and new rights and new packages and everything else. This is really hard. People at the very start of the ACA, some good people, stepped up and said they would get involved. Hmm. No one really did anything. Uh, It was still this idea that at the center of it, there needs to be a dictator. 
and this is this is always true with this why you find this all councils and and small groups mm -hmm. and charity boards all these things at the end you need one or maybe two people to basically say right well you know you said you'd volunteer here's a job you know, yeah, yeah rather yeah. than and what i didn't want to do that this time i want to say right once we've got these eight people on board Everyone has a has to have a discussion. Who would like to do what? Who's got so someone got uh, someone like doing social media stuff? Great, you look after the social media side. If someone would like to do uh, write stuff, we could do write stuff. Mm. If someone wants to do videos and films and uplift stuff and outreach and awards, it, but people are busy in this industry and trying to mm. get them to find time to do it and then getting them self motivated to choose to do something themselves is really really hard. So again, yeah. I blame no one but myself because I didn't want to be the ringmaster. I've done it too many times before. I don't like the concept of the cult of personality that it's, oh, it's Neil's thing. It's like, I don't mind people for the first year or two going, oh, Neil's the guy who got it up and running because yeah. I've got a history of doing that and that's fine. But I didn't want it to become, oh, Neil and Labrook, they're, they're the ACA people, uh, you know, for yeah. the publisher side of things, it goes against us. Yeah, you know, yeah, the whole, yeah. Putting your head above the parapet only works if there's a whole load of other heads coming up behind the parapet as well yeah that way uh, you can all be shot but individually you're you're safer and that was that's always worked before you know you can't be targeted or you might not easily so i don't know going forward i've got to make a decision i've pumped a lot of money into rebooting the aca's website putting new resources in place and everything else if the listeners would like mm -hmm. to be involved in a uk base so the whole day of the aca is it's for people who work within the uk audiobook publishing industry doesn't mean you have to be in the uk you could be a us or a hong kong or australian narrator but if you're selling your services into the uk or or, or and particularly particularly technical per people we want to balance it up and see what's best so if there are things that are going wrong if there's delivery issues there's spec issues if there's prep issues you know prep's such mm -hmm. a big discussion everyone talks about prep Mm -hmm. but who's leading the charge where do we go it should be equity of course because it really impacts on their members yeah. but uh, you know we have to prep as well and no one pays us for that work either in the same way no one pays us really for a lot of the back end stuff post-production stuff because yeah. we just kind of factor into the pricing so if people are interested and think that the aca would be something that should continue in the UK, sit alongside, be partners with PANA, of course, and be partners with in, in the unions. You know, we're good mm. friends with all these people. Then I would love it to happen because I don't want that investment to be wasted. Mm. But it will not be an organization that has a chair, chairman, chairwoman, and uh, uh, directors who follow the lead. It needs mm. to be an equal weighted group of people, maybe just four or five, who can put aside a bit of time every week just to keep it going, post news articles, find interesting mm. things, push guidance forward, ask the membership what they want. And then at some point after that, membership have to pay. Uh, mm. You know, I, I, I've pumped, how long has it been going for? Three and a half years. So let's say by the time we get to the end of this year, me and Labrook would have paid nearly six grand to run the ACA out of our pockets uh, and never got any money in. Now, that's just bad business. Uh, and I, me, my fault, but I wanted to get it off the ground. I wanted to run it. I wanted to keep it going, but yeah. there's no point putting money into an organization that other people aren't interested in running. So mm. uh, let's ask your amazing membership, you know, those particularly that are based in the UK, but anyone around the world who sells into the UK audiobook industry, have a look at the audiobook creators uh, Alliance website, see if you think it has value. Yes, mm. it's stalled, but it wouldn't take much to get it up and running again. Uh, we just need more regular news in information more interaction between people a mm -hmm. bit more socials going on and then see where it leads us after that whether we do training days whether we do guidance documents whether we fight for the rights of people to have cats in booths you know <laughs> that one's probably not much of a fight because you're going to get it or you're not you know as we discovered about 10 mm -hmm. minutes ago uh but let's see and if not yeah. then you know let's just accept that panna has got it covered and maybe ask Panna to have a UK board, a UK yeah, subdivision yeah, yeah. that can help, you know, because obviously there are great big differences between being booked to make an audiobook in the US and being booked mm. to do it in the UK. So those differences do need to be balanced out. Um, but there endeth the lesson, ladies and gentlemen, of, mm. of be careful what you launch. <laughs> I think it was, it is such a brilliant idea and I think it's so needed. And I, for one, 
um, <laughs> I thought would. Uh, Therefore, would... He's, if you volunteer and it's recorded, you can't edit it out afterwards. Oh no, I'm not. I'm not scared. I'm just scared of that. I would happily uh, help in any any shape or form I can. But uh, obviously, just for just for the listeners, uh, the ACA uh, website link uh, will of course be front and centre uh, in the description in the show notes. And um, I appreciate your support of it. Um, yeah, and it, it's interesting doing it on a podcast. This discussion because it's kind of a thoughts as they're happening kind of thing you know no decision has been made yeah uh, i would love it to grow and flower and be something amazing you know it, it started strong and we did some great work over covid and yeah. you know we did get some changes initially you know we did help be part of the fight to get audible uk to push up its per finished hour rate for narrators and studios you know yeah. we did get half the uk industry to to change its crediting policy um so there is power there it, mm. it, but it's a matter of refocusing it and making it a thing that's present and real mm. and happening. Uh, yeah. And I don't think that takes a lot of work. Um, but I'm not. I'm not ashamed to say I'm old and tired, and yeah. and I want it to happen. But I don't think I've got the energy to do it on my own anymore. Uh, and and I also it should not be down to one person to decide the direction of such an organisation because then it yeah. really just becomes a what does Neil want show. Uh, and as much as I like to think I'm a nice person who looks at what everyone else are, are wants and, and tries to represent them uh, and speak passionately for them, um, I'll miss stuff. I'll get stuff wrong. I'll think something should be this way. But in fact, the yeah. majority of people are, are thinking, well, no, 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 it should be that way. But they've just not told me. And yeah. so there's me banging on doors going, oh, yeah, everybody should get free chocolate when they go into a booth. And every, yeah. actually all narrators go, no, no, no. What we want is a, a heat pad. You know, it's like, yeah. Oh, you know, yeah. So that that's important, and, and I agree with you. Whether it's the ACA or, or Pana UK, for example, yeah, yeah, uh, or, or whoever, we need something in this country. We mm -hmm. need something to hold the publishers and the clients accountable. Not because they're not nice people, not because they don't want to make great audiobooks with lovely people and have us all earn enough money to pay our bills of course they do they're not evil people they're lovely people I've met many of them and gone to pubs with them they're fabulous but as if we look at it just purely on a business level just one set of cash moving from one place to another place that kind of stuff does need to be discussed at times mm -hmm. and yeah. away from creativity yeah it's one of the hardest things I, I have this i have to have this conversation every now and again with my clients and I invariably start with a quite a fluffy email, like, oh, I'm so sorry, I'm not sending you pictures of kittens. I'm asking you once again, why haven't you paid me? Yeah. Could you please pay me? And then I'll, I'll, it will take me 10 or 15 emails. It's only ever happened like once or twice to get to the point where I should have started with, which is, boy, you owe me money. I want it now or else. Yeah. Because I don't, I don't like not being the creative person and the fluffy yeah, yeah, person yeah. and the silly person. You know, and, and the mm. best companies have a person who has nothing to do with creativity and is just business. Uh, we mm. used to have one years ago when we were a, a production company for the BBC, a guy called Will. And I don't, he wasn't creative in his own way, but he was focused, laser focused on business. Oh, I wish Will was still here. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. Oh, it's so hard. <laughs> We have um, going more into the the education and I, I guess the social side um, of things. Like, of course, we have APAC coming up um, at the end at the end of March. Now, obviously, not um, you know there are quite a fair few uh, UK residents who don't have the thousands of pounds needed to go uh, over to the, uh, the states and and go that. And it does it does sort of bring me to this sort of question of: Do you think there really is a gap here in the UK for something like that for educational and also sociability? as well um and also of course apac is more sort of narrator driven and and, and these this various workshops that surround that in that are happening on that week uh are more sort of performance based it's often post productions massively overlooked um in, in all areas of course but also for for independent narrators or for the you know for that sort of thing do you think that's also necessary here in the uk to, to teach more people about post-production yes with the caveat that i don't want to do myself out of business but yeah. if we accept that there are these people and they are incredible these ho amazing yeah. home narrators who choose but even like why but even like how and why to like how they should outsource editing what they should look for in an editor that kind of thing so just education on the on the topic just a general really. education yeah i mean yeah it yeah. could be so you're new to the audiobook home recording market uh these are the basics on setting up microphone good mic placement or mic uh technique mm -hmm. 
uh, working with DAWs for the first time, the basic concepts of punch and roll versus uh, fluff and repeat, um, mm -hmm. how to find a good editor, what to expect from an editor, you know, what to ask them to do and what not to ask them to do, you know, stuff like mm -hmm. that. That would be, I think myself would be invaluable. Now I might yeah. be wrong. A lot of this stuff is given away for free on podcasts and you know, clubhouse. You know, we do it every Sunday. It's ridiculous. Yeah. We should charge for it, but I don't mind people having this knowledge because I'd rather, I am frustrated by bad audiobooks more than I'm frustrated by losing out on the potential of maybe earning a little bit of money helping you make a good audiobook. You mm -hmm. know, it's like, please just put out a well made audiobook because that represents all of us all of yeah. the time. But also it frustrates me because, you know, we at our end of things are working our nuts off to make a beautiful product and you're churning out that nonsense and it's being published. Uh, very aggravating. Uh, yeah. So, yes, I think APAC absolutely should focus, have some focus on production. Um, but I think we need a UK APAC. Yeah, I agree. I really do. I really, and I've said it for year after year after year, and I've said it to the people at APAC, I've said it to the Audio File Magazine people, I've said it to yeah. Audible. We need a two day conference in the UK with an awards at the end of it that is either mm -hmm. free or dirt cheap to enter, doesn't cost a thousand pounds a ticket to go to. You don't have to get massively dressed up for it if, unless you want to, but mm -hmm. you have two days, a bit like the One Voice conference, that's just panels and meet and greets and QAs and product demos you know get the session booth guys there get the studio spares guys there show off the equipment put all that together in a cheap affordable way somewhere in the center of the uk like birmingham or wherever yeah, yeah, yeah. so everyone can get to it and just do that and do that every year or every two years i can't find people who want to make it happen you know, yeah because it, it needs money and because we don't have a central group here we don't have the APA with its fairly high fees. We don't mm -hmm. have Audio File Mag and all of its uh, sponsors. We don't have Audible willing to put in. They put money into sponsorship, don't get me wrong, but it's quite a big sponsorship to put together that sort of event. Yeah, um, It takes a lot of effort and time and everything. There's nobody putting that stuff together. And I don't know, you know, maybe I should stop whinging about it and just do it myself, but I I, I can't, again, you, one person can't do this stuff. Yeah, absolutely. You, you just can't. You can do you a small assemble thing a down. Team. Yeah. Or, or we go back to your very early comment and we do it in a pub. We literally yeah. just say, you know what? I'm going to, I may be rude, but sod everyone. <laughs> I want this to happen. So I'm going to find a friendly pub with a big space and it maybe can take 50 people. You know, they're sort mm. of pubs. And in the summer, we're going to have a one day cheap as chips, basic ass affair. And we'll just invite people and we'll see who's interested and see, just see if there's enough interest to get that off the ground. Mm. And at the end of it, we will be a little bit drunk. We'll give out some silly awards to each other and we'll get in taxis and we'll go home. And it will be as simple as that. And if yeah. it succeeds, then we can look at doing a bigger one the next year because we can go to sponsors like, say, Studio Spares or uh, Neumann or mm. whoever, Apple, so, you know, people that want to be in our space and sell us stuff and say, right, we tried it last year. There was 50 people, but there was like 200 wanted to come. Mm. And it was in a pub. We'd like to do it in a hotel for two days, but we need 10 grand. Yeah. So maybe that's what we have to do. And like a me and a you and two other people who are interested just say, all right, we're going to pub it this year. The industry is fine. It's lovely, lovely people who I adore working with mm. and great projects, you know, books I would never pick up off the shelf come through my life and they're wonderful and they're different and they're interesting and I learn so much. Do I think the industry on its own will ever do anything other than just churn out book after book? No, not at all. Occasionally, you're going to get someone at a particular publisher who's very incited about something, who who gets mm. a project like a Pratchett project or uh, um, Marina at, at Bonnier. It does incredible things with kids' books, um, uh, and, and obviously the guys at Big Finish with what they do with audio dramas. There's always going to be yeah. outliers who do exciting projects, but as a whole industry, is just a bit kind of just day after day after day. Yeah. So if we want an APAC in the UK, I think it's just going to have to come down to a few like-minded people going just 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 do something even if it's literally a pub car park and a barbecue out the back of someone's car at <laughs> least if we start there 
yeah we can gauge opinion as to whether you know no, and if it's fun, enough people might say, oh, I wish I could. I, I didn't think it would be anything. But, oh, if you do it again, let me know. Yeah. And build momentum. I think that's going to be the only way we make any kind of UK-focused change mm. to the industry. Um, and if we make it fun and interesting and worthwhile, you can get into conversations with other people in the industry about changing it, of course. So of course, you know, yeah. there's always that little underhandedness to it. Uh, <laughs> not just having a barbecue and a pint. Uh, but, yeah, no, yeah. Let, let, let's talk, you and I see what we yeah. can come up with for this year and see if we can do something nice. Cause you know, the other thing that needs changing in this industry is accessibility. You know, we both know um, some amazing people who have different disabilities and, uh, but, but particularly for, for those who struggle with, uh, with issues with their sight, you'd have thought mm -hmm. the audiobook industry would be a slam dunk for them. The publishing industry could just take them on board, bring them through as interns. Okay. Yeah. There's going to be some things that are either impossible for them to do or take a lot of adaptation to allow them to do. Editing is a very difficult thing to do when you can't see, but it is absolutely doable. Mm. It just requires more time and a little bit of thinking, but certainly the management, the, the marketing, uh, even the studio directing and all that can all be done by, by people, uh, of different, you know, different disabilities, yeah, 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 yeah. different natures, different abilities. And you don't see it happening. And, you know, why is it down to a few of us on the on the outliers of the industry sort of constantly going on about why does, why is this, have you heard of this guy? He should be, give him an internship. It drives me mm. insane. So again, sometimes I wonder if trying to do it the official way, have a meeting, see if you can change policy, meet the person from HR. It's so slow and it's so yeah. difficult. But get them a little bit drunk down the pub with a burger. Yeah. yeah. And someone might just say, you know what? Let them come in for a week and see what it's like. I yeah. don't know. I might be talking out my, my, my fundament, but it just feels like more things get happened in the publishing world when you're at a restaurant or a pub than, than necessarily in a, in a, that's probably wrong completely, but it just feels I, like that. I know what you mean. I definitely know what you mean. That idea of, of meeting people face to face as well, which is uh, obviously rare these well, days. Which is why so many UK people go to APAC and I yeah. get it. If I could afford it and I could take the time off, I'd, I'd love to go once just to, yeah. just to literally shake every hand. Americans love glad handing. It's brilliant. Yeah. I like that side of it. UK people, I'm not sure. <laughs> Ignore the COVID thing, you know, it, it, it can be an ethereal handshake but they like it they like the face like, oh you made the effort to fly five thousand miles and pay yeah. two grand for a hotel room to get here you yeah. know they they recognize when the uk people come and so i would love to do it one year just but i would be a pain in their ass because i would be asking every apac person well why isn't there a panel on this and oh why could we yeah. not have done it because you know but it works for them it's their thing yeah. and it's amazing uh, and I'm really excited that the people I know who are going to APAC, they're going to have a great time because the APAC people put on a great show and you're going to learn so much and meet so many people. But it's interesting because it's like going into the big swimming pool. <laughs> it's like the number of narrators that will be there. Yeah. And, and you know, if you get to meet the people from Podium or, uh, 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 or um, God, names of American studio publishers just all dropped out of my head. Uh, but the big famous uh, studio publishers, you know, they, they've got their rosters. They've got their sag after mm -hmm. rates. They've got all the things that work for them. Trying mm -hmm. to slide in as the sneaky UK person is like, oh, good. Yeah. good luck. I, I wish you well. People do come out. You know, Billy Fulford Brown absolutely smashed it. And, you know, he's one of our, best known biggest uk names working from the uk for the us yeah. you know john banks is another one absolutely smashed it um it's worth going particularly i think as a narrator because that that's a proposition they're expecting to see sold to them uh us turning up as a hey we've got two studios in croydon right and where's croydon south london why didn't you just say london oh yeah, here we go <laughs> <laughs> how many do you churn out and what's your production pipeline and it's like oh okay we're a bespoke bbc style production it's not going to work is it like, oh, here's my rotating tire it's like you know yeah, yeah, yeah. i don't know but i'm glad it exists but if we could do it in the uk if for no other reason then we can get a celebrity reader to come in and the, invite the press mm. to write about it you know mm. I don't know. We could talk about this for hours and it's not a podcast thing worth talking about on a podcast. Uh, but yeah. Um, yeah. yeah it, there, there's a future for the UK industry, but I think it's up to us 
probably us on our side, the creative side, to be the ones to push it. Yeah. You know, I always go yeah, back yeah. to the incredible Rachel Naylor and what she's done with her VO network stuff. You know, it's it. She's got a big yeah. team and everything else behind her now, but it's all her. Mm. I mean, that is cult of personality. I mean, you know, she wows people whenever she goes, and you know, she's this beautiful, talented, incredibly intelligent woman who just blows you away. But she's worked hard and hard and hard, year after year after year, building that machine that's that it's turned into. But it's never stopped being a very personal thing for her. Um, mm. But that's the proof of the pudding, isn't it? That one person, yeah. and obviously she had help from a couple of people. And Book Machine's another example of it, where they're rolling out, they're getting more staff now as it gets more successful. But it started as a small one or two person idea, and they just went for it. With no idea of it being what it's now become and what it will probably become in a few more years' time. Uh, so yeah, we, I think if, if we on our side, I guess it's come back to why I set up the ACA, but if we on our side say enough's enough's enough, we want awards, right? Well, set them up yourself. This is what we did with the APAs. We wanted awards for technical people in radio. Mm. Sony's weren't willing to do it. BBC weren't willing to do it. So we as a radio independence group, now audio UK went, all right, we'll do it. And it took a couple of years and we got up and it took a few years to get settled. And it's now turned into a major award, you know, a little mm. bit of a monster, but it's still a major award. So if we want awards, we just got to do it ourselves. Yeah. yeah. It's going to be a little bit difficult. People will accuse us of just awarding ourselves things. And so, yeah, I recognize that the first year we do this, you can't give me the lifetime achievement award. I recognize <laughs> that year two, but <laughs> you, get, you get all those accusations of self-serving. But it's a starting point. Yeah. You know, if the publishers don't know we all want credits, then they'll never give us credits. If they don't mm -hmm. know that narrators should be paid X and producers Y, they'll never offer it because why mm -hmm. should they? It's not in their best interests, you know. But I've never yet met a mainline uh, publisher who, when you talk to them about these things, isn't willing to talk about it. Mm. It's just, are you talking about you as, as Neil or Labrook or are you talking about the industry as a whole? And the same with this kind of a thing. If if yeah. if we want to have a party, and you know you're young, but the older you get, the more this becomes true. If you want something, like if you want to go to the pub with someone, that you can't wait for them to ring up and say, yeah. "Oh, Neil, I was thinking we haven't been to the pub for ages." You know, you got to ring them up and go, "Oi, we're going down the pub." <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, you've got to make it happen. If you're the one who wants a thing to happen in life you've got to go out and get it i mean none of that kind of your dreams come true nonsense but the simple stuff like this so yeah. i think let's ask your listeners you know what do they want what would they like from a uk thing and being honest that the first year it's got to be small but yeah. what would be a key thing what would allow you to say to yourself i can take a day off and i can get on a train or i can pay for the petrol which is ridiculously expensive or in my case stop four times to recharge my car um, to get to a central place and spend six hours with a bunch of people i've never met <laughs> which is really scary because we're all introverts well yeah apart from me. uh I, I, you know so we, what what's the how can i get over that psychological hurdle of doing it and if mm. whatever that needs to be we then try and organize that yeah. I guarantee it will be if we can get Dirk Max to come and do some kind of drumming thing or, you know, the you know, live yeah. performance of Hitchhiker's Guide or something, you know. <laughs> yeah, that'd be awesome. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Neil, Neil Gaiman or Joanne Harris will turn up and sign something. I don't know, you know. <laughs> we'll probably have know. to dig deep into our celebrity friend's pocket and see who we can persuade <laughs> to help us. But, you know. It, that'd we'll have John... to be all you. I don't have any celebrity friends. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll get John Coleshaw to come up and do a, a routine or something, you know. <laughs> That's where the whole budget will go. <laughs> you have to be bring your own barbecue because we've just paid for John Coltshaw to come up and do some impressions. But it'll be fun. We did um, obviously mention it the first time around, but I think it's so important as I think it's such an amazing resource. And just on the off chance that there is a listener who isn't aware of it, I just wanted to make sure that they are. Um, but the Sunday Schmooze, I, it's such a phenomenal resource such a great time for people I, I just wondered if if you could perhaps sort of sum it up a little bit for us tell us a little bit more about it but then also you, your experiences doing it and how that's perhaps evolved since um the first time that we had a chat about it yeah well thank you um so sunday schmooze is it's on this thing called club house which was really exciting about 12 months ago and seems to have just disappeared um but it still <laughs> exists um it's not zeitgeisty anymore it's become you know zuma or whatever yeah, yeah. um 
but it's an app which you can get on all platforms and it's a bit like it's like a global radio station with many many channels a bit like sirius or xm in america where you've got many many they call them rooms but let's just call them well yeah sort of clubhouses basically so there's a there's a there's one for audiobooks and within it there are many many shows and they happen at different times of the day sometimes concurrently generally one after the other and they all have different topics and everyone who who logs in becomes part of a like a conference panel and you're in the audience and there's a few people up on the uh, up on the dais and they're discussing a thing and in most of these rooms the audience is very much part of it so you're not just there to listen you're there to ask questions come up on the stage it's a kind of a free-for-all it's really nice it's very chatty and conversational um, and many of the rooms uh, are there as ways of offering support and encouragement and and so on it's very nice i like to think of it it's quite fluffy um it's a very good place to go. And it's been going for a few years now. So the Sunday Schmooze started about, we haven't got the exact date, but we think it's 18 months ago. And it was off the back of a Sunday morning room, which still exists, just had its two-year anniversary. Um, and the Sunday morning room is very much, uh, they call it a cuddle. It, it, it's a, a place, a safe space where people just go chat. And then uh, invariably they, mm. they go off topic. You know, it starts about how's your week been working in yeah. audiobooks, but it tends to go off into people's life stuff. And it's really, it's really good. Yeah, it's a very nice place to go and vent. But myself and my co-producer, Morrison, have been thinking for a long time before we heard about Clubhouse about doing a kind of a audiobooks how-to, so chat to producers thing, a bit like an AMA on Reddit. But but we're thinking maybe we do it on Twitter, you know, Twitter Live or Facebook yeah, Live. Yeah, yeah. Kind of work out how would we really get an audience? How could it be interactive? Then we thought, well, maybe we do like a, a monthly online conference, but they're really expensive and or, or you're limited to X number of people. And then suddenly Clubhouse comes along. We've both been listening to this this Sunday morning thing. Like, oh, we could do a Clubhouse room. So Sunday Schmooze, a very silly title. Uh, it's actually officially Sunday Schmooze with audiobook producers. Set out on every Sunday five. It was really five till six in the evening on UK time. But it's become five till seven. Um, and the idea initially, and very much was what happened, was that we would take questions from audiobook people from all over the world about the production of audiobooks mm. so mostly these are home recordists asking about microphones desks cables background noise how to edit this how to think about that what they should do you know and probably the first six months was full-on q a mm. um a lot of me aing mostly because <laughs> of my background as a sound engineer um i felt really bad because poor moz would just sit there for like half an hour as i rambled on about you know, <laughs> microphone pornography uh but you know he seemed to enjoy himself um but we kind of started burning out of the questions people the audience remained very uh consistent you know around wow. about 50 to 100 people every week come back which on the clubhouse room is pretty good for something yeah. that's not got any celebrityness to it yeah um and it's it's, it's consistent and uh, so the kind of questions run out because we pretty much answered everything three or four times over and i presume people had worked it out for themselves or just didn't need questions so we actually did think about shutting the room down because it was just it was getting a bit dull. We were kind of vamping constantly. I started playing around. So my background is as a broadcaster in the UK on a commercial radio, and I do love jingles and radio shows, and I really miss doing live radio, and it's something I wish I could get back into. So I started without even talking to Moz about slightly turning it into a live radio show. So if people aren't going to talk to us, we'll just talk to them, and we'll just entertain them, and we'll talk nonsense and. Uh, it will all be audiobook it'll be based on what we've done that week and what news is happening and what we've seen and hopefully say say something in the in the best traditions of talk radio which gets people to want to come up and talk to you mm. uh and so we started going down that route and then of course those who've heard the show i started investing in jingles uh and more jingles and then getting celebrity friends to do more jingles it's become a jingle show uh but that's fine because <laughs> me and you know it pays other people uh but um but then we started also using old interviews and getting people on the show more regularly as special guests uh, and then digging into my archive of audiobook interviews from an old radio series i had and that's really where we sit now it's 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 like just a live two-hour radio show ostensibly about audiobooks but often wombling off into other areas to generally to do with audio but sometimes mm. it's about speech and language and life 
and yes cats uh but, <laughs> but less cat we less on the cats most often but, but you know it, i the idea of it is and i hope this is why people come along because a lot of people we ha- rarely hear from a lot of our audience now they rarely interact with us hmm. but they're always there every week so it's definitely become a radio show yeah because that's what radio shows are they're a thing you regularly tune into but you rarely interact with but you you come back week after week which is weird um so it is a bit of a struggle i have to admit because trying to find stuff to talk about for two hours Mm. um and i get quite down about the fact that people won't raise their hands and talk to us anymore it does upset me it does Mm. worry me but they're still there so Mm. clearly we're not boring them or upsetting them in return uh but i do worry that you know occasionally we will take a sunday off either because one of us has got relatives around or or you know just over new year we decided to give ourselves two or three weekends off it's fun i love it i love Mm. it because it's become a radio show it's very easy for me you know i've had a few people say god the amount of prep you do to get that show ready to go it's like well jingles yeah <laughs> and into if there's an interview so when i'm at the studio at labrooks i'm always thinking about because we've got a, an interview area set up permanently using a road a road podcaster set up yeah. um so if i get on well with a with a narrator and they've got time they're not racing off at the end of a session i'll ask oh could we just do a five or 10 15 minute interview that will go on my show because it's really hard to persuade people who aren't on clubhouse to go on clubhouse yeah yeah and that means we can get some really quite interesting people to come on uh just not live yeah. um but hey that's good in two hours you do need to go to the loo um so <laughs> you know that's always helpful uh, so i hope that's of interest to people what we try to make it is a just a weekly friendly place for people within the industry to come and say hi if they want to uh, they rarely do but they're there so i'm assuming it's a silent hi uh, <laughs> which now when i say that sounds like a drug-induced haze but maybe that's what we are for some people a lot of them are in america so for them it's lunchtime um, yeah so i don't know there's a few people who are even further away and for them it's like you know five in the morning i don't know why they're tuning in then <laughs> be crazy but i hope we're your listener i hope it's enjoyable it's it's a bit of work but again because i come from a radio background the idea of suddenly going live Mm. and being expected to talk doesn't scare me as you can tell from this podcast it's the thing you get is what all broadcasters get is which is am i am i still being relevant is is there any need for this and we don't know because no one tells us. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, I can tell you my opinion. I, I think it's incredibly relevant. And I think there is a, a real need for it. I mean, for, for me, um, I was going to say surprisingly enough, but it's at the same time every week. So that it, it's not really surprising. But I make my tea um, <laughs> during during the show. So I'm there chopping veg up, chopping stuff off, listening to it. And it's become a part of the routine, you know, and it's, it's sort of nice. And especially when my partner's off in the other room doing her thing, I'm with you guys hanging out, even though it's just, you know, even though I'm just consuming rather than giving um, uh, most of the time. But it's, it is tremendously helpful, uh, not only as a resource because obviously the educational aspect to it and you, you get to hear stuff and you get to hear what you're up to but also just and pure entertainment and it's you know you're talking about things that matter a lot to me and is in my world um so yeah it's uh it's incredibly um fulfilling to listen to um in my opinion at least and i'm sure i'm sure many people they wouldn't be turning up if they didn't think so that's the reality you know? is that i always look and, and you know you have to look about an hour in because people are coming mm. and going and leaving and then you look at the end and you see the total number and normally we've, we've got up to about 100 150 people have come in and out of the room yeah, some of them are going to be bots and some of them are going to be people who are like, what's this? Oh, that's terrible. <laughs> so, you know, I always think that we've got a kind of a key core 50 people, yeah. which in radio terms is terrible. But in terms of a small app based broadcast, it's, it's really good. I think so. You yeah. Know, you pop into yeah. some other rooms, they've literally got three or four people there. And yeah, there may be very, very interesting discussion going on, of course. But yeah. you know, then there's others with tens of thousands of people and they're all talking at the same time. It's like, this is crazy. How yeah. how, how is this of use to anybody? Um, yeah. I, I'm very proud of what we do, and I, I'm and I'm really proud of what Morrison brings to it because mm-hmm. he doesn't come from a broadcasting background, uh, and he, you know, he's learned as he goes along. And I do say to him often, you know, do shut me up. Um, <laughs> you know, I I try more and more now to to not answer first unless it's something really obvious that it should be me because just the differences of our backgrounds. Yeah, um, I do always try to let Morrison 
have a first say I, you, know, you notice he introduces the show yeah, where yeah. i used to introduce the show and it's because i want people to get to know him as much as well as i know him you know he's this incredible yeah. human being who's warm yeah. and kind and intelligent and caring but he's also incredibly talented and incredibly unassuming and obviously i'm not i'm mr braggadocio shout it from the rooftops <laughs> kind of guy because that's where i came from as a broadcaster um but i want the world but the world let's be fair the amount of work he's got doing sunday shows, <laughs> editing work it's all it's all the ladies he never yeah, works yeah. for men it's all the ladies <laughs> you know he there's something going on and i'm very happy for him uh but no that's but i do want the world yeah. to get to know him better um and the schmooze is a good way of that because he he's someone that i think everyone should get to know he's a, such an incredible yeah. man um but yeah you're right you know they're always there those people mm. are always there. They're obviously giving them something. And so, yeah, we will continue to lean into it being more of a radio show yeah. affair. Two hours live. <laughs> on your books, FM. You know, that kind of nonsense. I've literally, yeah. the money I've spent on kit in the booth I'm in now to be able to run it like a professional radio show with, you know, f- you know fast start buttons and, and uh, being able to play in sound sources and do all that kind of stuff mm. is ridiculous. I mean, gosh. I shouldn't have done it, but you know, sounds, miss, sounds uh, great though. <laughs> the jingles being, are brilliant. Yeah, I miss being in live radio, so it's, it's my nearest thing I can get to. So, it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it's fun, and if we're educating, but and there is always one at least one technical question a week, and it's really nice to be able to talk about that and mm. just make sure. I, and I do like the fact that there's this group of people around the world who know that if they hit an issue, technical issue with making the audio book, we're going to be there on a Sunday, and they can or they can reach out privately, but they yeah. now know there's a couple of guys who. And this is true of the audiobook industry as a whole. We're always there for each other. You know, I had a thing, I can't tell you exactly what it was a couple of weeks ago, but I desperately needed someone to record four words for me for a thing. And they're a big name person, and I could not in any way get them into my studio in Croydon. There's just no way. Their schedule is just utterly insane. Mm. They're happy to do the four words for me. And so they said, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be at this central London dubbing studio on Friday doing a job for a big name person. Um, if you can get them to say it's OK, then I'll just do it while I'm there. So I'm thinking, OK, well, all right. So I reach out. And I've never worked. don't know this studio yeah. from Adam. I mean, they're really famous broadcast studio. So I reach out and explain the situation and everything else. I was fully expecting them to say, yeah, we can, but it will have to, you know, we'll have to charge yeah. you like 150 quid or something. And they're just like yeah uh, is he he's fine could we just get an email from him and his agent saying he's fine to do it so i got that yeah. and i went yeah okay we'll just double check with the producer at the client for the advert that we're doing just see if we can just yeah. tack it onto the front or end it shouldn't be a problem again half an hour later like yeah 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 the client's like cool so don't worry about it so i went back and went yeah but i'd say for how much is it going to cost what do you mean how much is it going to cost he's in the studio and it's four yeah. words yeah. And they just made it happen. And, you know, by the end of that week, I had this thing which I desperately needed and was panicking about. And it all got done and everyone was happy. I got lovely notes from them. And I was able to say to them, look, I know there's nothing my little studio in Croydon could ever do for you. But if you ever need something, yeah. just let me know. Why? Why would a triple A studio be like that? Because why not? Yeah. Because it doesn't hurt. And, and it represents the audio side of our industry so well that people bend over backwards to help each other out and to offer advice and just to be there for each other you know we we are very quick to stop thinking of each other as competition which i've never known in any other industry um outside of possibly live radio uh you do think of each other as competition when it comes around to rehiring time but you you yeah. You might be upset that you lost the breakfast show, but you're happy that someone else has got the breakfast show kind of thing. Yeah. But yeah, audio is incredible. And I think the clubhouse shows and what you're doing on this podcast and what people like Morrison do and and, and mm. so many people we know, Anna and, and, and co do, is to stop everything and go, oh yeah, no, of course, if we can help you. I know this thing. Why shouldn't I? Do? Now, I'm sure we're all being idiots. <laughs> I'm sure that we should all be saying, yeah, I'll happily tell you that as 50 quid. You know, all these people who earn money training other people is yeah. because they put a brick wall up between the people and the information. And so if you want to get through, it's 50 quid or 150 yeah. quid or 500 quid. And none of us do that. <laughs> I'm not quite sure why on such a poorly paid industry we don't. We don't. But maybe it's because we know the other person hasn't got the money to pay. So what, what, yeah. what the hell? But actually, 
I know the real reason. It's because people are lovely at heart. They want to help each other out. And we all love what we do. Um, and none of us want bad audiobooks in the market. No. We really don't because it's embarrassing for all of us. And, it, and that yeah. one person may have gone, oh, you know, I joined Audible because of Stephen Fry. I'm going to try something that's not Stephen Fry. And they listen to it and it's just badly produced. And they go, I'm not renewing my subscription. Audiobooks are rubbish. Oh, it's like, well, ah, we can't have that. Yeah. You know, no matter how badly we get paid by Audible or anyone else who sells our titles, we still need our titles selling. So let's make them as good as we can. And if that means I, I give you a bit of extra information that I know, well, why not? Yeah. It's very, very unlikely that I'm missing out on an editing job by telling you. <laughs> how to use spectral editing. <laughs> <laughs> now, if you want to be trained and to do it really well, <laughs> there might be a bit of money involved there. But <laughs> There is just a lovely sense of humanity um, into the most of uh, most of the folks that I've met doing this podcast, for example. It's, um, it's been really lovely. Um, I'd like to end, uh, as, we, as we come to a close, by simply asking you, um, just if you, if you have any upcoming projects um, th that you can perhaps mention that you're excited about or anything in the schedule that, that we, uh, we can perhaps look forward to down the line. Mm, really hard to tell you what any of them are. Um, obviously, yeah. I am excited by the rest of the Pratchett's, and they're all coming out over the next few months. So... Yeah. Um, Pyramids is coming out in March, read uh, by Alfred Enoch, and I think it might already have just come out. Monstrous Regiment by Catherine, uh, read by Catherine Parkinson. Um, Indira Varma has come back to read the final five uh, young witches books, uh, which includes the very last Pratchett book, The Shepherd's Crown, hmm. uh, which is incredibly moving, which we recorded last week. They come out later this year, and then obviously the eight. Um, guards books which i still can't tell you who's recorded them yet because we're pre that announcement but they will be amazing so they're all coming out yeah. over summer i'm really excited to get all those out into the world although i do apologize for my american friends for whom not all of the titles are being released something to do with different rights oh I really think, i think they'll get released over time i just i don't i i'm very confused yeah. by it all and no one's told me anything um yeah. then we've got some great doctor who coming out and we're about to start recording some of the new this year's doctor who target novelizations so that's exciting they'll be coming out later yeah. this year most of them have been announced by the bbc um i can't remember what any of them are top of my head <laughs> uh, they're doctor who they're fabulous yeah. um and uh yeah just just really interesting stuff we're working a lot with storytell now and i don't know yet how storytell titles are going to be listenable in the uk but they are going to be launching mm -hmm. them on the uk platform so i would say keep an eye out for storytell uk they're doing mm -hmm. some really interesting stuff most of the titles are actually english translations of uh, swedish and uh, norwegian and dutch titles and german titles which is stuff we wouldn't normally get so it's really nice yeah. to be open to that you know new new literature yeah. uh and they're really nice people and it's going to be interesting seeing a new model of audiobooks as streaming media coming into the market uh i'm obviously alongside what spotify do but in a much yeah. uh much less nefarious way yeah, uh, yeah. so <laughs> i shouldn't say that they're nice people really uh yeah and that's it really uh, we're we're about to drop back into as i call it kind of week by week audio booking and there's a few things booked in, but I'm on the hustle now, just sort of going back to clients to say, you know, I had to keep saying no. I'm kind of saying, please, <laughs> stuff now. Um, yeah, the, the schedule's a little empty at the moment, but it, it will fill up quite quickly. Uh, so, yeah, some really interesting stuff and some really interesting narrators. We're trying to work with people we've not worked with before uh, as much as possible. And that's really exciting. And then, and then we just we, we're aiming for December the sixth, uh, which is our official tenth anniversary of the studios being open. Um, and that's going to be very exciting for us. Yeah. Very pleased about that. And then we'll see what happens the year after that. But between now and then, keep listening to the schmooze and and come to our party we're going to have in the summer, presumably by the sound yeah. of it. Uh, you're paying. And... <laughs> I don't know. I didn't. None of you know who I'm pointing at when I said you all. So uh, it could be anyone. Uh, but yeah, it's really exciting. I'm just uh, hoping to hear more podcasts from you and more interesting guests. And hopefully all of us can make the industry, particularly in the UK, just take one one new step up. I don't yeah. know what that step is yet, but let, let, we, we've, had, we, we've understandably post COVID had a couple of years of just getting on with it. You know, just yeah. surviving. And this year's a tough year for us 
I don't know what it's like around the rest of the world. I'm sure it's terrible, but for us mm. in the UK, you know, our government, our finances, our everything are all over the shop and yeah. lots of people are struggling. So we can't control most of that, but we can control our industry a little bit at a time. Mm. So let's find a new step to step up onto all together. Um, and so maybe that is a, a party award, something in the summer, maybe it's something else. I don't know, but let's see what we can do. You know, it'd be exciting. Yeah. You know, 2023, who'd have thought we'd get here? Where are the aliens? <laughs> I was expecting us to all be overtaken or overruled by ant overlords or something by now. It's weird actually thinking about it because 2023, I remember as a kid thinking, oh, what age will I be in 2020? And now we're in 2023. And mm. yeah, it's like, is, wow, this is the future. It's, <laughs> it's, it's very yeah. odd. Very odd. Is yeah. uh, I just finally packed away all my stuff having moved like two, almost two years ago. I just finally got the whole, like the storage shut down and everything into the loft, thrown a load of stuff away. And the stuff I was looking at, it's all from like the early 80s, mid 80s. I've held on yeah. to all those years. And of course, it takes you back and you remember who you were at that point. And I'm just thinking, I don't think 2023 is exactly what I imagined the future to be. <laughs> no. It's like, although I've got to admit, you know, iPads and phones and 80 inch televisions and, and endless Star Wars and, yeah. you know, it, it's all cool. Yeah. <laughs> it's all I know what you mean. Is it, is it like the, 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 the frog being boiled slowly concept? <laughs> no. like, Possibly. It's like, it's like when you're in, because you're living it, it's like you don't notice how radical the difference was. And it was only when I realized that again, like this December will be the 20th anniversary of the passing of my best friend. And so I have this point in time, which is fixed, which was 2003. Mm. And I remember everything about 2003. It's like, I can literally flick a switch in my brain and be living there because it's, it's like a stopped clock almost. Mm. And that's when I recognize how amazing the world is around us outside of all the horror and terror and nightmare stuff that's going on. But in terms of the technology and the fact that we can have a booth in our house where we not only can record a professional audio book, but do a live radio show and a thousand and it's yeah. all affordable and doable. And I think to what my best friend, if he literally appeared right here, right now, I mean, I know he'd do it like he's a zombie in American werewolf in London, just to freak me out. But it's like, if he suddenly popped up, he'd be looking around going, what is this stuff? Yeah. 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 <laughs> we only just had our first flat screen computer monitor a couple of months before he passed away. So it was like, Whoa, the difference between CRTs and 80 inch flat screen <laughs> plasma OLED stupid 4k things that we all have in our living rooms now it's like, man, you know, we're in it. So let, let's embrace that. Let's embrace yeah. that together. You know? No, you're absolutely right. Uh, and I, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, all of uh, Neil's links to social media, the ACA website, uh, and of course, the schmooze uh, will be linked in the show notes. Thank you so much for tuning in. And of course, another huge thank you uh, to you, Neil, for joining us. It's been so fun to chat to you. Thank you so much for having me and keep up the good work. You are uh, so invaluable to our industry, just, you know, giving a voice to so many people. So, you know, there's more weight on your shoulders, brother. <laughs> Thank you so much. Frustrated by the royalty rates for your audiobook? Annoyed that when the digital distributors say 70% royalties, they actually mean 70% of 50% or 80% of 70%, neither of which is an actual 70%. Wishing there was a way to cut out the middleman? Yet, you want your audiobook listeners to have a smooth and positive experience, and a direct download sale from your website won't deliver that. We at Pro Audio Voices hear you. Out of our commitment to our author clients, we've created Amplify, a program that provides an actual 65% of the sales price that you set, that gives you access to your customers' names and emails so you can reconnect with them, and keeps you in the driver's seat. Check it out at ProAudioVoices.com. You'll find Amplify in the marketing menu.